When local growers put great food on Tennessee tables, that's Living Green. Join Live Green Tennessee as we see what's baking at the doorstep bakery, visit the Putnam County Farmers Market with Tammy Allgood, and take a tour of a 200-year-old farm. Plus, Cindy Putman steps into the Green Galley to find the best ways to preserve your fruits and vegetables for the winter months to come. We visit the Medicine Garden and so much more right here, coming up next on Live Green Tennessee. This program is brought to you in part by the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. This summer, there's fresh, local food grown by a farmer you know at Tennessee farms and farmers markets near you. There's fun there too, with berries to pick, animals to pet, games to play, fish to catch, and color you can bring home to last all summer long. This summer, find yourself on a Tennessee farm with picktnproducts.org. Tennessee Agritourism Association offers various options for family fun on their website. Lists of farms to tour, farms offering camps for children, festivals, beautiful gardens, and trails for horses all in beautiful Tennessee. The Tennessee Agritourism Association is proud to partner with WCTE-TV. Visit tnfarms.com. I can find drill bits? L7. Thank you. Hey, aren't you Charlie? Charlie's here? Charlie? Charlie? People know that farmers have some of the best advice around, like you don't have to be a farmer to save money with Farm Bureau Insurance. Farm Bureau Insurance. Tennessee turns to us. Charlie, pick up on line one. <laughs> this happens a lot. And by Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. And the generous support of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Connecting the grower to the buyer the country to the city, and smart shopping with a healthy lifestyle. It's Live Green Tennessee. Hello and welcome to Live Green Tennessee. I'm Melinda Kiefer and I'm proud to be your host for the show that teaches the importance of shopping local, eating healthy, and taking that step to live a green lifestyle. It's no mistake that bread is mentioned in the Lord's Prayer. It was an important part of survival in biblical times, and for many families, the same is true today. At the Doorstep Bakery in Manchester, Tennessee, Rita Munn's day starts before most of us even consider getting out of our beds. She and her daughters, in the quiet morning hours, go through a patient daily ritual of baking artisan sourdough bread and handmade cookies and pastries for their community that nourishes their spirits and brings joy to their doorsteps. My day usually begins in the bakery along about 3.30, quarter to 4. We need to get up early to get the sourdough out and start working with it. And I'm usually, normally, the first person up. And the quiet right before we start is very important. It kind of centers me. And I'm very grateful. I really am. And I don't take it for granted. I don't want to take it for granted. I'm very grateful that I'm able to do this. So that moment is very important. And then the girls will get up and we'll, then the kitchen will start hopping and we're moving and doing things. And then the next time is when the bread comes out of the oven and it goes out to the customers. It's very important to me to see that product. I think in that moment, some homemaker a hundred years ago did the very same thing I'm doing today. That means a lot to me. It really means a lot to me to, to follow on that tradition, to imitate her journey in my journey. When we first uh, started, I remember my daughter and I woke up in the morning. We made a batch of cookies and, you know, eight or so loaves of bread, and we packaged it. And my daughter said, now what? <laughs> I said, yeah, now what? 
Well, we had had uh, people that knew what we were doing and were very interested in being on our delivery schedule, so we started there. You know, we went to the people that had said, oh, you know, let us know when you get started. And it grew by word of mouth from there. So we started with Manchester Farmers Market and, uh, oh, we were thrilled. To us, that's just the best. Then um, I got a call from the Big Farmers Market in Nashville and asked if we'd like to be a part of that. Yes, we would. We would love that. So I, I would imagine if it continues, we'll just keep going, you know. Uh, if you want to be on our delivery schedule, give us a call. If we can, we'll bring by some things for you. We're part of the Real Bread campaign. This is to bring the awareness to artisan breads. Uh, the slow food movement, awareness to where your food is made. It isn't just about getting it fast, it's about, you know, who makes it, how much time it takes to make it, and uh, a quality product. Of course, Pick Tennessee, that's one of the things that we're the most proud of. We like to think that we put it, we're so proud of it, we put the logo on the label of everything that goes out of our kitchen. We just feel very strongly about being a part of Pick Tennessee. And um, then these things, these different organizations are all together in that they're trying to raise awareness of the local community, eat locally, and who produces your food and, the, and make certain that that food is produced in an equitable way and that people uh, are delivering a product that reflects the work involved in it, you know. So that's part of what we try to raise awareness to as well. Make the kind of cookies for customers that we made here at the house. On a day where it's dark and rainy, that affects the way the bread rises. So, but when we look up and I look out there, I say, okay, today's a good bread day. It's gonna be fast bread today. Um, and the only thing that keeps us from cooking more is as soon as I can make up my mind what kind of oven I want and where we're going to put it. I have five daughters and so at one point in your journey you become the daughter, but I had inquired about the domestic kitchen thing and um, so I needed a hundred dollars to sign up to do it. and. Um, an anonymous person who I found out later who it was gave me a hundred dollars and said I want you to do this oh my gosh I was so overwhelmed so overwhelmed so all right, I didn't have the excuse of no money so I registered the night before I was supposed to go to Nashville and take the class I said to my daughters I'm not doing it I, who do I think I am I can't go to school I'm not doing this so the next morning, they came into the bedroom, got me out of bed. Meg and my, the oldest daughter that is here still in Manchester, said, get in the car, we're driving to Williamson County, and I'm dropping you off and you're taking the class. It was, it was overwhelming. They were just so encouraging. And then as they came home from college, they became more involved. But it feels great to have them in the kitchen. You did good, Laura. These are worthy. Huh? It's worthy. It's worthy. And I'm surprised that Laura, I mean that Maria has learned so much. Like I said, it took me 30 years to get to this point. She's learned it in a summer. <laughs> this is so light. You did great. That's good bread. That's beautiful. It's the most beautiful thing I ever saw. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Maria wants me to get a regular deck of conver convection oven, you know, like you see in a uh, cafeteria kitchen, and just buy more cast iron. Because the cast iron really adds to the bread, like you told, like the cast iron gives it the iron and the, all these minerals from the cast iron. It makes it just even more nutritious and awesome. And you get that, that makes that perfect round shape. And you, when you take the lids off, like the oven makes it nice and dark and brown, that crusty feel. You know, when you're a young mother and your children are really young, you think, well, they're not really paying attention, or will they ever appreciate that? 
but the truth is they do and at some point in your journey they will let you know in their own way that they really appreciated what you were trying to do so that's where we are with them and I really like that I belong to a homeschool co-op and I teach Latin to the children that's one of my little hobbies anyway we have a film that we show it's a National Geographic film of, of about Pompeii it's a museum in itself but one of the most interesting parts for me is, is the uh, volcano erupted at noon, noonish, lunchtime. And um, so the way the lava flow came and the way it buried everything in the, uh, the pyroclastic flow and the ash stopped. Everything that was happening was caught right then. And so that means that that's the place where they have the cast molds of the people. Homes were covered as well, and when they re-unearthed it, people had their lunch laid out on the table. Well, what's on the table? A loaf of bread, figs, and hard-boiled eggs. And that's just, that just speaks to me in a very deep way. And I will do the same thing. That, that bread has crossed all those generations. I just think it's, to me, that's why we do it, why, why we bake bread, and just keep that art form alive. Farmers markets are going strong all over our great state with the most local fresh fruits and veggies available. Recently, Live Green Tennessee visited the Putnam County Farmers Market with Tammy Allgood. Helping pick Tennessee products celebrate 25 years, the Complete Southern Cookbook author talked with some local farmers, gave great tips, and showed a few tricks on picking the freshest produce from your local farmer. Roy Pendergrass from Bledsoe County, but you're here in Cookville, selling corn. Tell us about it. Well, it's a nice place to sell, a good environment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of sales going all over there. You gotta get around where you sell stuff somewhere. We're here today with Brenna from Hidden Springs Orchard, and these blueberries are absolutely gorgeous. Thank They're you. huge. <laughs> Tell us about them and how many plants have you got? Well, I've got a little under an acre patch, so I'm not really sure how many plants that is, but um, they've kind of grown into a hedgerow because they're a little over 30 years old now. We're here with my buddy, Kenneth, from Applecrest Orchard. Hey, bud. How you doing? I'm doing good. You tell me about these lovely peaches because I'm getting hungry just standing here. These are uh, homegrown ones here. Here? Here. And we're about 14 miles down the road. I love it. And these are, this, this one's called Majestic. It's a super sweet peach, melt in your mouth. Yum. Juice runs down your legs when you, when you try to eat it. Yeah. And Drips off your chin. Yeah, all over you. Oh, if, good. If you don't get it all over you, it ain't no good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, the, and they're so big. What's the variety? They are. They are Tiff Blue and Climax. So they're the rabbit eye. Perfect. And you're selling them here at the Community Farmers Market. And I understand that you're one of the regulars here. Yes. I've been coming actually since we had it at the Presbyterian Church since I was in middle school. Oh, I've been selling with my grandfather, yeah. Terrific. Yeah. And you say your grandfather still gets out and, mm -hmm. and mows the orchard. And, oh, yes. And, and, and then you've got also the nursery part of Hidden Springs. And that's where you, the pawpaws are that are one of my favorites. Yes. And she also, my aunt runs the nursery, Annie Black, and she also does, she actually sells some blueberry plants and other plants, too. We're here with Ashley Williams with Three Sisters Farms. Are you one of the sisters? Yes. My two older sisters are at home. Oh, terrific. And y'all grow all of this beautiful produce and you sell it here on the farmer's market. Tell us about what you've got. Well, we have blueberries and we have at least five different varieties, the rabbit eye, southern and some northern. We also have fingerling potatoes and some, we have at least five varieties of heirloom tomatoes. And we also have hot peppers, which is jalapenos, we also do habaneros, uh, Thai, cayenne, a bunch of different types of those. Um, we have beans. Uh, and especially a CSA basket. Yes, I noticed your CSA basket. So you you grow all of this, you harvest it, mm -hmm. and you bring it to the market. Are you here on a regular basis? Every Saturday we usually here. Okay, got it. So they can come see three sisters and Ashley. You're the cutest of the sisters, right? <laughs> Absolutely. We're glad you're here, dear. Thank you. Well, I'm already I'm getting one kind at a time now, but. 
pretty much that's true. Terrific. And you're here on the market how, all the time? Tuesday through Saturday. Tuesday through Saturday. Terrific. So people can come find you. Yeah, we, and you also sell straight at your farm? Yeah. Terrific. So it's straight from the farm, ready to, farm, ready to farm, eat. Farm, right. And what's the variety? Uh, oh, that's my favorite. Excellent. We're glad you're here. And you were here last year, you're here this yeah, year. We, we sold quite a bit here last year. Terrific. Yeah. We sold, I bought blackberries over earlier and sold them. That's whatever we get whenever it comes in. And we, we move it here. We got some going to Jamestown today, too. Terrific. So when you leave here, you'll have an empty truck. I hope so. Yeah. We appreciate it. <laughs> And you're going to call me, and we're going to have a chat on the phone. Okay, about what? Okay, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> come on, look, come see Kenneth. He's lots of fun. <laughs> well, when you return home with an armful of goodies from a farmer's market like that, you'll want to cook something fresh. But then again, you may want to put away some of that delicious summer produce for the colder months that are surely on the way. I'm Cindy Putman and we're here with Chef Hal in the Live Green Galley and we're so excited because today we're going to be talking to you about the best ways to preserve all these wonderful things that you've been growing in your garden or in your raised garden or even in a small container garden. And Chef Hal, thank you. It smells wonderful already. Thank you. Nice to be back in the Green Galley. Um, we're excited to just show everybody a little bit about how we preserve some of our last harvest um, at the restaurant, at home. Um, we're going to focus on some things that are fairly popular in terms of tomatoes, peppers, corn, and basil. Um, I think we can just go ahead okay, and... Okay, what are we going to get started yeah, with? We can start with uh, some tomatoes. Um, we're getting some of the last tomatoes from one of our local growers in East Nashville right now at the restaurant. And what we like to do with the tomatoes is just kind of stew them down with a little bit of olive oil, garlic, salt, and pepper, and let them simmer um, very low heat for maybe an hour to two hours, um, releasing some of the water. And uh, that would, of course, magnify the flavor of the tomato um, before we would ultimately um, jar the tomato. And the kinds of tomatoes you have I absolutely love because these look like heirloom tomatoes. They, and those are my favorite kind to get at the farmer's market. Not those really round perfect red ones but those that are all different colors and all different shapes and they're really really beautiful. They are beautiful and we have a couple of the raw tomatoes here that we've used for these. These are actually grown for us by CC Gardens in East Nashville. Um, we tend to focus on smaller tomatoes for this. Of course large tomatoes would be fine um, I like to slice those up and put them on sandwiches, but um, these are the ones that we use a lot in the restaurant for certain recipes. Of course, now that tomato season is coming to an end, um, we're, we're going to be jarring some up so that we can use some in, in February and January when uh, that nice, beautiful flavor of a nice tomato will, will be a little more precious than it is in, in June and July, being that they're gone and out of season. On a cold, wintry night, yes. when someone wants some really good homemade soups or pasta sauce or something like that, one of those cans of tomatoes would be worth its weight in gold. Absolutely, and it's, it's already kind of cooked for you and, and ready to go. Um, what we've done here with the jars is just the, the basic technique of jarring. We've, we've boiled and sanitized the jars and the lids. We've pulled them out, let them dry. Um, and you've you wanna, actually done that in the big cooker right over here. We have, we have. And, and, and here's an empty jar, and, and we got our, our nice little funnel here. And, and we can just simply fill this up until it gets to the top. You now, want, do you try to put the extra liquid in, or do you uh, leave out some of the extra liquid? I like to have a nice ratio of tomato to the liquid so that when you actually would uh, be using these at home, they wouldn't be too dry or too wet mm -hmm. uh, for depending on what recipe you wanted to actually use them for. So now we have the, the and, ring and, and they've and been the nicely lid. sanitized. And, and one thing, excuse me, I do want to show everybody is to always make sure, even if you use a, a nice funnel, you always want to make sure the, the rim is, is nicely uh, clean so the seal can actually take place there with the tomato and we'd put the, the lids on and, and seal them up and then this would go back into um, our, our nice little um, vessel here that's made primarily for canning and we'd boil that for about 10 to 15 minutes and, and pull out and um, we'd let it cool 
And one trick I would like to share with people that's always been a good trick for me to know that you have a good seal is this obviously we just filled so we haven't boiled it yet and you can see that you can still press press on the pan on the top of the lid a little bit where on this one you can't because the the it's taking place the vacuum's taking place here and it hasn't taken place here yet and we've also done um, some pepper relish that we have over here that we've already also jarred as well in the jars here and and what we've done here, you can see a beautiful basket of peppers that we have here from the garden. We've got a number of different variety of peppers there, and, and I like to intermix all the different variety. And we just kind of rough chop them um, along with some onion and garlic. And then I use some water and vinegar and sugar and salt and, and kind of cook them down in that. And then there again with the same procedure, we'll, uh, we'll jar the pepper relish. And this is just, so great for so many things. Um, well, I'm thinking a big pot of pinto beans and a big pound of cornbread. That sounds this great. This would be perfect. That and it smells great. wonderful. It has a spicy smell and yet a sweet smell at the same time. When you're preparing your peppers, how important it is to take the seed, is it to take the seed and the seed membrane out? I think it's important, um, especially with the hotter peppers, because that's going to obviously make them more hot. I typically just take my peppers, cut them in half lengthwise, of course, discarding the top stem. And then after I cut them all in half, I'll go back and pull all the seeds out of them. And then I just kind of rough chop them a little bit. You could even put them in the food processor if you wanted to and just maybe pulse it and then get a nice kind of rough chop on it. Um, I think it's okay though for the peppers to kind of be a, a variety of, size of sizes. And, okay, what are we gonna make next after we've had our peppers and we've got our wonderful tomato sauce? Um, then I'd like to maybe share how you can um, save and preserve some corn and some basil. Always at the end of the year, our, we have about 10 basil plants at Eastland Cafe and they just produce, produce, produce. And, and even right now, we have so much basil, but as it's starting to get colder outside, if we don't do something with them in the next two to three weeks, um, we could potentially lose a lot of product. So a very simple thing to do with basil is to just make a pesto. And um, we've made a pesto here um, yesterday actually at the restaurant. And we just simply use the, the basil leaves, some nice Parmesan cheese, some garlic, um, olive oil, salt, pepper, and we use toasted walnuts. Um, you know, original recipes for pesto will call for pine nuts, um, and pine nuts are wonderful and delicious. Mm. They do tend to kind of be on the pricier side of, of the nut family. Um, but we always have walnuts at the restaurant. I mean, you could use pecans, you could use almonds. I, I think the nut, you can do really whatever you want. And then we just use olive oil, and once again, in the food processor, we, we pulse it and, until we get the consistency that we want it. And with the pesto, I think you could freeze it in Tupperware, you could freeze it in ice cube trays, you could freeze it in Ziploc bags. Um, that'd be completely up to you what you wanted to actually freeze so it So it's in. a pretty versatile thing. You could do a lot of different things with this. I mean, freezing it a lot of different ways and then serving it a lot of different ways. Sure, and I think some people like the ice cube tray because after it freezes, then you can put it in a Ziploc bag and, and give it a good seal. If you had a food process, or I'm sorry, a food saver, um, that would be really nice. Um, but what the ice cube tray does is kind of give you a portion size. So, you know, you can take what you need and, and know you're not getting too much or not enough when, when you're actually going to be cooking your dinner. And so what would you add this to if you have this great pesto that comes out in an ice cube shape? I, I, I mean, I think a pasta kind of right off the bat. Um, we've even done things like mixing pesto with butter and serving it with fresh radishes before dinner. Um, which is a nice way to do it. Anything um, mixed with butter is good. Yeah, Anything, yeah. it doesn't matter what it is. So that's beautiful pesto. How long will that keep in the refrigerator if you're just gonna keep it in the refrigerator and not freeze it or do anything else with uh, I'd it? I'd say in the refrigerator it should be good for at least a week. I think the kind of the, the way it has a layer of oil on top will kind of help it preserve itself with not allowing the oxygen mm -hmm. to, to penetrate. But you can see how it does oxidize a little bit on top, but as we mix it up, that, that beautiful green color kind of comes back out. Um, 
And it is it is a beautiful, beautiful dish. And, and I love the way that you uh, said, you know, all the flavors mixed together because even when we stir it, you can just smell the aroma. It smells so, it so does, good. It does smell good. Okay, so we've got our pesto. Now, let me just ask you about these leaves. Uh -huh. Are there some leaves that you should not use because a few of these have just a little bit of browning on them. Does that affect at all what you should be using or um, what you should be choosing if you're going to do your pesto? I think if what you're looking at bothers you, you you can certainly discard it. Um, I always say if you wouldn't serve it to somebody you, you really care about, then, then don't serve it to anybody, you know. But um, yeah, we just pick the leaves off and uh, maybe give them a rinse because being that they do come from the garden, uh, we will find a, a, a small spider or, you know, some kind of little critter on there from time sure. to time. So you want to make sure that you be aware of that as you're using the, the food as you pull it from your garden. But this was just picked this morning. That's beautiful. And Is there any time you use a younger leaf as opposed to an older, you know, more mature leaf? I think sometimes I like to use the bigger leaves for the pesto. And then if you're using, you know, if you're cooking something fresh, you know, some of these smaller tops are, are maybe nice to use as like a garnish mm -hmm. or something. I think so you know? too. Oh. Well, we love pesto at my house and so I can't wait to go home and I think my basil's really on overload right now. It's been really growing a lot, yeah. so I'm going to be able to make some of that for this weekend. Now, let's talk about corn. corn. Everybody loves corn. And corn is certainly one of those things that, I mean, when summertime starts getting here, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to corn and tomatoes. Those are like two things on the top of my on list. Big on top of a big old hot biscuit. Yes. That is a true southern thing on top of a big old cat head biscuit. But that corn is beautiful mm, corn. It, this is beautiful corn. Um, it shucks so nicely. Uh, the, the silk on it. Um, we just got this at the Nashville Farmer's Market. And I mean, you can just see how nicely the, the husk pulls down. And there's not a lot of silk on there. It's very easy to shuck. Um, That's I, a perfect ear of corn, just right for this program, for a perfect, perfect day. It is very nice. Um, I have simmered some in some water with a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. Um, I think that kind of helps the, the flavor of the corn come through. And then I also have some raw. Uh, some people um, prefer to do this raw. Um, but what we want to do anyways is, is very carefully, and sometimes we set ourselves up a little barrier because the, the corn does tend to kind of yeah, go every which way. But we just want to cut about a half to a third of the kernel off. And then after we're done doing the whole ear, what we'll do is take the back of the knife and kind of go down the corn and um, add that into the corn. And then once we do this, we could just give it a quick saute and, and maybe some butter or some olive oil. And then what we really want to make sure we do is to absolutely let the corn cool 100% before we would then um, take some Ziploc bags and uh, obviously put the corn in the Ziploc bags, try to squeeze as much air out as possible, get a nice tight seal on it. Thank you so much, Chef Hal, for all these wonderful pointers on how to take care of these this last bountiful harvest that we have from our gardens or from our farmer's market. And we're so excited that you joined us here in the Green Galley, and I'm so excited to taste some of these delicious things. Well, thank you so much for having me. Pharmacist Op Walker's education lies in modern medicine, but his passion lies in educating people on the medicinal aspects of healthy foods like the small but mighty bean. Welcome to the Medicine Garden. Beans rank among the oldest of vegetables, and as far back as the 12th century, a Spanish physician wrote that beans benefit the stomach. During his early voyages, Christopher Columbus introduced the American bean to Spain, and the superior American bean became the world's dominant variety. The bean's medicinal benefits have only been recognized with the help of modern science. Known as the poor man's meat, beans contain as much or more protein than does an equal serving of tuna, beef, or chicken. Beans consumed in a weekly diet helps to prevent constipation, lowers blood cholesterol levels, and due to low sodium and high content of potassium, beans are excellent for those with high blood pressure. An excellent source of folates and iron, beans benefit a vegetarian diet during pregnancy. But remember, add a few drops of lemon or consume vitamin C in order to get maximum absorption of the iron content of beans. Also, beans should be eaten with other foods such as rice, corn, wheat, or oats, 
or with sesame or sunflower seeds to ensure an adequate intake of the amino acid methionine. For those with a propensity for flagellants and intestinal fermentation, beans are more easily tolerated as a puree. Those suffering from gout and or arthritis should eat beans in moderation due to beans uric acid forming purine which causes gout. Beans are recommended in cases of eczema, itchy dry skin, cutaneous allergies, and general dermatosis as well as for the prevention of hair loss, seborrhea, and dandruff. The pantothenic acid found in beans strengthen the hair by decreasing its fragility. The high cellulose fiber content of beans benefit in the prevention of diverticulosis and colon and rectal cancer. Niacin consumption has been shown to protect the body from the three Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia. So now that you do, in fact, no beans, make them a regular part of your diet. I'm Dr. Alf Walker, and see you next time in the Madison Garden. Every day, public television offers a huge variety of safe, educational programming for even the youngest of our children. But what kind of person makes these shows? Who writes these imaginative songs, and what motivates them? We'll meet Conductor Jack, a man who combines family tradition with a passion for education to bring young children an energized Tennessee-based act known as the Zing Hoppers. My wife and I created a show called The Zing Hopper Show, and uh, it's a show for preschoolers. I play a character in the show called Conductor Jack, and uh, toot toot! Conductor Jack is a train conductor, and uh, he's got three friends. He's got a possum and a donkey and a kangaroo. My wife does the voice of the possum and of the donkey, and I do the kangaroo voice. My parents were both musical. My grandparents were musical. My great-grandpa was a, in, in vaudeville. He was a vaudevillian, and he put himself through college doing you know, vaudeville sketches and stuff. And, um, you know, I came from that tradition. And I mean, I put out my first CD. It was a Dixieland jazz record. I put that out senior year in high school. And I was playing bars and clubs and, you know, doing, you know, the coffee house gigs and stuff. And it just got to be such a drain. And my wife was traveling with me and she was in the band playing. And we just both were like, we can't do this forever. It wasn't fun anymore. I guess I went back to school. My wife went back to school. We got teaching jobs. We were doing that. It was really fun. We had a great time. And um, I, you know, because I had done music my whole life, it was natural for me to just bring in a guitar to the classroom. And instead of asking kids to line up to go play outside or to you know, wash their hands, we would write little simple songs about washing your hands or about you know, lining up or now it's time to take a nap or things like that and uh, or now it's art time and a lot of it was you know just strictly from being in the classroom and writing little songs to help and we realized too a lot of preschool teachers and, and early elementary teachers realized that if I say something to the child it's not as good as my you know friend Penelope the possum we created the show uh, really just a sim simple sock puppet if I ask you to go clean up the room you might not get the room clean if our possum or our donkey goes hee haw please help me clean up the room all of a sudden kids really want to help. So um, one thing kind of led to another. This was a couple years ago and we started getting more and more work uh, you know, from our students' parents and uh, you know, asking for birthday parties or things at church or things like that. And uh, it just kind of rolled into a full-time career. So now this is all we do full-time is just kids' music. Uh, my wife does most of the business and kind of the creative stuff and I do a lot of the live gigs and things. And uh, we do a lot of live work. We do about 500 shows a year. And we chose the name Zing Hoppers because hopping is a natural movement for kids to do. And we're gonna stomp our feet. Oh, good, all right, here we go. <laughs> Time to stomp. Really big. Really, really big, big stomp? So, um, okay, all right, here we go. That was really important to us to choose a name that kids would relate to and wanna hop along with us. And uh, it also promotes physical fitness and, and uh, you know just physical activity. And I mean, I was, I, I've, since I started doing kids music full time, I've lost like 75 pounds just doing kids music because you're up there hopping and stuff. I still have a ways to go, but I mean, I, I, it is a really physical show. I am one of the actresses that plays Sunny Fix-A-Lot for the Zing Hopper show. Um, I am the railroad mechanic that helps fix the happy train, and I help solve problems using my imagination. Um, I'm also the marketing director for Zing Hopper's Entertainment Group. Um, and a mother of a two-year-old and four-year-old who are huge Zing Hoppers fans. So that's how I got involved in things. I am a Zing Hoppa mama. Um, I'm involved on every level. Family, shows, schools, everywhere we can take it. And I'm really excited for uh, the business to be expanding, the music to be shared nationwide. 
With the Zinghopper Show, we keep the audience's attention span into consideration, and we know that kids are natural helpers. Any parent, any educator would, would tell you that kids are natural helpers. Um, it's, it's more effective to bring home a message if you can ask them for help and not preach something to them. Um, also by demonstrating, not just telling them what to do, showing them what to do um, and making it fun. And that's why setting um, these messages to music is so effective. Um, we've seen it with a cleanup song from our Sing Your Way Through the Day CD um, used in classrooms and at home. And the same thing with um, our Reduce, Reuse, Recycle running for the 3 R song. Um, same thing, we've had parents say that the kids are running to the trash can, running to the bins to sort things with their aluminum and <laughs> getting really excited about it. So it's good to see that, um, that it's applicable in the home, in the classroom, and, and that it's taken away from the show. My child was this age. My child's 13 now and in middle school, so he doesn't exactly like to come to this. So I actually go get some friends of mine, kids that are working. It's fun and it's educational, and uh, she has a really good time. And, I love watching her dance and sing and clap and just bonding with the other kids. It's a, it's a lot of fun to watch. I really love the way that uh, the Zing Hoppers incorporate some of the positive attributes of reducing and recycling into their program. The kids have fun with it. They don't know that they're learning, but actually they are learning. They really have a good time with that. We're really trying hard to kind of incorporate uh, health and fitness and also positive uh, living choices, uh, you know, green uh, elements to the show and, you know, talking about reducing, reusing, recycling, and then also songs about healthy eating. We've got a song called Ballad of a Salad that's all about, you know, lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers, and we've got a song called In the Garden, which is all about how, you know, how to grow, really. I mean, it's a song about organic gardening, and so, but it's for preschoolers, and that's what's really neat about it. Impacting the children is, got, is what's gonna make a difference, making them aware of it now, because they're the ones that are gonna take over the whole thing pretty soon anyway. So we've got songs like Running for the Three R's, we've got songs called C-O-L-D, which is all about, um, you know, reducing, I mean, you can't tell this to a preschooler, but it's about reducing your carbon imprint in the world and reducing, you know, uh, you know, if everybody can just do, you know, one or two things to help out, that's kind of our, our message. C-O-L-D, let's help stop global warming by, all right, we need to do that one more time. C-O-L-D, let's help stop global warming by planting a tree. Good job, you guys. C-O-L-D, really good. That was great, you guys. All right, we've got one more song we want to introduce you to. So we've got those songs. The um, whole soundtrack has been coming together, you know, really interestingly. We have been recording, uh, we've got tracks from that were recorded in England. We've got tracks that a uh, friend that recorded a track in South Africa. We've got a friend in, in LA and in New York. We're here in Nashville. We've got people in Texas and Canada, Toronto, all over. And they've all been recording. We've been doing the entire uh, soundtrack just digitally online. And um, so we've put out, in the last year, we've put out five CDs uh, in the last year. We put out a DVD this year, and now we're uh, working on the TV show element. So it's really been an exciting time. I'm pretty much always excited and happy. I mean, I work pretty much seven days a week, 365 days a year, living my dream. I get to work with my wife and a great staff of people that are really fun. And you can't, you know, even if you wake up grumpy, you go to a show like, you know, like this and you just, you go to a show and you, you see kids having fun and dancing and we get to have that fun experience of working with kids really from baby 12, four or five and see them have these firsts. And so in our show, there's a lot of firsts, like a, the first time they get to hop, the first time they know they can stand on one foot, the first time, and you can't have a bad day. I guess I quit music to be a teacher, but I didn't quit teaching to do music again. I feel like I'm a teacher first, and a teacher that uses music as a tool, not a musician that teaches. And I guess I still, even though I'm playing at gigs, and I might be at a, a library one day, and a county fair the next day, and a theater the next day, that can still be a classroom and I can still use the elements of what I learned in school on you know, child development and things, I can use that in a different classroom. And it, it could be a county fair, but it's still a, every moment with kids is a teachable moment. And how I live my life in Tennessee directly affects how somebody lives their life in Japan or in you know, Argentina or Australia, anywhere. And um, I, kids are universal and the message we have is universal. and. Uh, We've gone overseas to Australia before, and I've played in France and in England. I've played, you know, shows where it's completely. I've done shows in Mexico where 
I'm really, and we do it, we present it in English, and kids are still reacting, and there's a, there's a spirit to the music and to the beat and to our smiling and our, just our, our spirit that I think is global, and, I, and that's really, truly my goal. And it's, um, I think that I could do more for the world uh, the more resources I have, so I just want to keep working as hard as I can and pushing and pushing and pushing and uh, make no bones about it. That's really my goal. I really, really want to uh, be the number one children's property in the world. <laughs> I got a lot of work to do. <laughs> The foundation here at the hospital asked if the Master Gardening Group would be interested in helping with one of seven horticultural areas that were being designed around our new facility here at the hospital. Master Gardeners decided that they would take on the garden for the Cancer Center because it was, of all the gardens, the only one that directly touched the most patients. Horticultural therapy is actually something that has been around for many years. Like so many other types of therapy, like I think of um, pet therapy, uh, not as much research has been done until recently when it has been discovered that by giving people green areas, areas where there's living, growing things, you will have patients that will heal more quickly, they will have a brighter attitude towards life, and they will respond more to various treatment options that will get them not just out of the hospital, but better. Well, the mural was the first part of this project and one that then set the stage for the rest of the garden. And what was decided was that we wanted to convey to patients that no matter what path life takes you on, there's always going to be hope as long as you have loving care and support. And that led us quite logically to the passage in the Bible that tells us of the footprint story. Among the wide varieties of plantings that we evaluated and eventually chose include this particularly lovely bush, which is a uh, fire mountain prius. Uh, some people call it the lily of the valley because of the type of flower it has. The weeping spruce is a fun little guy. The top will get heavier, the sap gets soft in the summer, and the weight is going to bring this down so that it's actually going to be laying almost right on the ground. In addition, we knew that we needed to have some uh, color even though we had winter months and not much flowering, and that of course would lead anyone to go into the Lenten Rose or Hellebora. You'll also notice that we've got some dead stuff. And you think to yourself, well, why are you doing that? You're supposed to be keeping this garden nice. And that's true. But this time of year, there's something that's going to happen and we have to f forget about pruning because we're gonna have the good old dogwood winter. And that dogwood winter hasn't arrived yet. And when it does, it's going to be cold, maybe only a day, maybe two, but it's going to be cold. All this dead stuff is protecting the babies that are coming up, and we want to keep them protected till after that occurs. And then we can come in, remove all the dead stuff, and make this garden look spiffy. You will notice that our uh, path here in the garden has created what we refer to as the circle of life with the pavers that we made. This was an extremely important design element for us. What we wanted to do was try to include and embrace as many people as possible whose lives have been touched by cancer. It became a very special and meaningful project that was then turned into this circle of life effect that you see here. And these pavers have become a meaningful uh, example for people who are missing their loved ones. They will come here to the garden and sit and kind of meditate and have a little quiet time with their memories. And it's just been something that has added a special touch to the garden. One of the final touches for our garden was this sculpture which was designed by Professor Coogan in the Medalist Department, Tennessee Tech. 
And what this, the, the tree itself is a pounded steel that he did. And then his graduate students each designed a different animal out of copper. And I think it was, without a doubt, the fine, fine touch that our garden needed. Um, it is our sincere hope at Putnam County Master Gardeners that we have created something that will give people hope for tomorrow, the difference between a bad day and a good day, and a loving memory for those that are honored in our garden as well. You know, many people believe that family and tradition are what keep a farm going strong. One of these people is Wanda Shanks. Not only has Ms. Shanks lived on her Buffalo Valley farm for over six decades, but she continues to work this nearly 200-year-old farm seven days a week. An octogenarian championship basketball player, Ms. Shanks believes it's her daily chores that maintain her vibrant health. Everything from feeding stock to seeding hay to delivering calves. My name is Wanda Shanks. I live at 2900 Maddox Cemetery Road, just off of Hopewell Road in the western part of Putman County. I have been living here on the farm for 61 years. Uh, when Walter and I got married, we moved to the farm, and this is where our three sons grew up. Walter, who is a nuclear specialist, he and his family live in Birmingham, Alabama. Wayne, who is principal of Cookville High School, he and his family live in Cookville, and Stanley, who has gone to be with his dad, his wife and children still live in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, the Maddox, we're related to the Maddoxes. Uh, my husband's great-great-grandmother was Margaret Maddox Shanks. And so it's been in the family. Walter is a fifth generation uh, Wayne and Walter will be the sixth generation, and I have uh, grandchildren who will be the seventh generation. And this is why I'm so interested in carrying on and keeping the farm up so they'll have it to take over uh, one of these days when I decide to retire. Now, I'd like to tell you what has been told to me a little bit about the farm. There were 14 families that lived on the farm and made a living. There was a country store, a grist mill, a broom factory where they made brooms. The rock barn that you see in the background was a 14 mule barn. Uh, the rock barn is about 200 years old. I think the fence perhaps are a little bit older than that. The big red barn here on the farm is 110 years old. Now, when I did some work on the barn, I wanted everything, all the original, keep all the original that was possible. As you notice here is a 1937 date. This was put there by Pete Nichols. Uh, and of course, there's some other initials that I don't quite know uh, who put them there. But we had to restore part of the barn, uh, uh, this side of the barn because trees had grown up in it and the rocks had fallen out. So uh, this barn has two layers. There's an outside layer of stone and then there is an inside layer. The inside layer looks just exactly like the outside. And then as they would hew out the rocks to fit where they was needed them to put them, um, all the little pieces of rock they would pick up and put in the center. And that's what they did on this side of the barn, the whole side we uh, restored it. Uh, now, when I did this, had this work done, you notice that we put new support to it. These are huge cedar trees that were cut off the farm. They're all about the same size, and in place of having seven small stalls up and down. I made three on this side in order to take care of my cattle. When I sell cattle, calves, I load them in here, put them in here and drive them right out and put them in the back of the trailer. It's made it real easy when I have to get cattle up and especially uh, load them up. This has really helped me a lot. 
Wright Barn was used during the Civil War to uh, store their ammunition. And, uh, and of course, uh, the Indians used to uh, uh, make their ammunition, the arrowheads and everything, uh, over on the hill. We have found uh, uh, where they uh, made them. And we also found uh, uh, axe, stone axe that were chiseled out. So uh, around here was a very popular, this farm especially was a very popular farm back in those days, especially with 14 families that live here and, and, uh, and they all had children. It, it's just important to uh, keep everything that's possible and, and if you work at it, it can be done. Uh, it, it takes work though. Now I work on the right fences all the time and even to my grandson Wes, he, uh, he helped me a little over a year ago, we was working on the right fence. Well, he says, Grandmother, this is just like putting a puzzle together. I grew up on the farm. There were seven of us children, and I next to the oldest, and uh, Daddy taught us to work. And I enjoy working. All of my brothers and sisters have enjoyed working. And I, I especially love farm work because you get up, it's um, something different every day. Uh, maybe you've got to fence the day and, and uh, maybe you've got to doctor cattle or take care of your animals. Uh, and of course I raise hay. I don't, I haven't in the last two or three years been able to produce enough hay to take, take them through the winter. But, but I do my own hay. I, I cut my hay and, and rake it and I have a neighbor that comes in and rolls it for me and then I put it in the hay barn. Just last week, um, I checked my cattle every morning and they all were not up. And of course, the first place I thought of was my neighbor's hay field. Well, sure enough, that's where they were. And I, I ran them back across the creek. I just waded the creek put them back. I see myself uh, keeping the farm and operating the farm until the boys can come and take over. I don't know how long that would be. I feel good. Um, I'm in good health and, and, uh, and the, more the, the more you work, the healthier you are. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's, I plan on taking care of it until one can come back here and and uh, take over. All of us at Live Green Tennessee would like to congratulate Miss Shanks and all the Lady Bulldogs for another gold medal this year in the Senior Olympics Basketball Championship in Houston, Texas. Live Green Tennessee is all about exchanging the ideas, information, and resources required to take advantage of the abundance that is Tennessee. Please visit our website for these and all of our past stories from Live Green Tennessee. You can also find us on Facebook and become a fan or email, tweet us or call us. But be sure to stay in touch to share your recipes, notify us of agriculture and eco-friendly events, or just let folks in on your favorite gardening tip. We hope you'll join us next time on Live Green Tennessee when we'll feature new stories and bring you more exciting news about Tennessee markets, farmers, and businesses who are making the move to eating fresh and living green possible for all of us, right here next time on Live Green Tennessee. This program is brought to you in part by Behind every Pick Tennessee Products logo is a Tennessee farmer who brings you fresh, local food grown with the kind of pride that gets handed down through generations. From now through fall, you can find Tennessee fruits and vegetables on farms and at farmers markets near you. Find your Tennessee farmers at picktnproducts.org. Tennessee Agritourism Association offers various options for family fun on their website. Lists of farms to tour, farms offering camps for children, festivals, 
beautiful gardens, and trails for horses all in beautiful Tennessee. The Tennessee Agritourism Association is proud to partner with WCTE-TV. Visit tnfarms.com. Do you know where I can find drill bits? L7. Thank you. Hey, aren't you Charlie? Charlie's here? Charlie? Charlie? People know that farmers have some of the best advice around, like you don't have to be a farmer to save money with Farm Bureau Insurance. Farm Bureau Insurance. Tennessee turns to us. Charlie, pick up on line one. <laughs> this happens a lot. And by Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. and the generous support of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.